Welcome while you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we are delighted that you have welcomed us into your home. We certainly would love to hear from you, so please send us an email with a question or a comment to jimandjoy at EWTN.com. And we're excited to have our guest today. His name is Joel Stepanek. He is the Vice President of Parish Services for Life Teen. He's also a Catholic speaker. He's the author of several books, including the book that we are going to be talking about today, Chasing Humility, Eight Ways to Shape a Christian Heart. And this beautiful book is available at EWTNRC.com. And when we were talking back with Joel in the green room about Chasing Humility and why the, chap why the name, I mean, it really is true. All the days of our life, we're chasing, we are in pursuit of holiness. Um, this is the journey, uh, the journey of holiness. And so we have to pursue uh, uh, virtues, right? All those ways of becoming holy. And until the day that we die, and, and in all of the circumstances and situations that we go through, it's always an opportunity to change. <laughs> Joy, over the weekend, we got to share this uh virtue of humility with some of our grandchildren. We did. The Robinsons yes, yes. with uh, Gabby. Anna and Gabby and Sophia. Sienna. And Sienna. And RJ. And RJ. Yes. Yeah, that's a beautiful picture of them with the sun breaking through on them. So they were visiting with us. And, you know, we just kind of raised the virtue with them and said, what, how would you talk about humility? What is humility? And, and boy, you know, there was a silence for a while. And then one of them just said, I understand humiliation. You know, mm -hmm. what's the relationship between humiliation and humility? And what a wonderful conversation. Then we went to pride and mm -hmm. what is pride and shared about my father's very spiritual saying, don't be too big for your britches. What does mm -hmm. that mean? Don't be too big for your britches. Don't be too big for the clothes that God's, you know, given you and you're kind of puffed out. You're too big for the clothes he's given you and just knowing who we are. You know, we have to know who God is. And we had this conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say that to encourage you just to, to sit with your grandchildren and your children when you get the opportunity and just raise a virtue, raise, raise a reality, and then speak about it. Mm -hmm. As well as we spoke about uh, last Sunday's lesson on, on marriage. On, you know, on marriage. The family and, oh, and why a woman readings. was made for a man and how, how they complement one another. And then the, the love of children and that children coming forth and that marriage is not only about a man and a woman, or adults, it's about children and children's rights to know know their parents and so on and so forth. So all that to say, um, share with your children, share with your grandchildren. Chasing Humility, Eight Ways to Shape a Christian Heart uh, by Joel Stepanek. Uh, it's a wonderful book. We've really enjoyed it. He does a lot with the litany of humility you might mm. be familiar with. So there's plenty more to come. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back while well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and today our guest is Joel Stabonik. He is the Vice President of Parish Life Services for, Teen, for Life Teen. He's also a Catholic speaker and an author of several books, but today we're going to be talking about Chasing Humility, Eight Ways to Shape a Christian Heart. Does your heart need some shaping and some tweaking? Mm. It's a great book. It's available at EWTNRC.com. And you can visit his website, joelstepanek.com. Well, Joel, we are delighted to have you on our show today. Good book, right? It was, you know, we're running our race, right? And we have a great cloud of witnesses that are praying for us as we run. But we always have to be chasing something. We have to be chasing the greater, everything that is good and true and beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to tell our family a little bit about Joel, and then we're going to talk about humility. 
Yeah, that sounds great. I am blessed to be married to Colleen and I have two kids named Sophia Grace and Elijah Daniel and they keep me humble and they help me be holy. So mm -hmm. that I think is the most important part of my life. I have been serving in ministry for about 15 years um, and grew up in a Catholic household watching EW10. So even yeah. being here in mm -hmm. Mother Angelica's office yeah. was a wonderful gift, uh, but didn't really take ownership of my faith until high school when I entered a youth ministry program and had adults there who cared for me and challenged me through a life teen program and continued to walk with me through the ups and downs of being mm -hmm. in high school and college. Uh, lots of humbling moments, mm -hmm. lots of big moments, uh, lots of conversion moments. And I found that it really is about running a race and chasing something, which is ultimately holiness. Mm -hmm. And I found that holiness and humility, those things are tied together pretty mm -hmm. tight. They are. You can't have one without the other, right? No, you cannot. Because as you know, I was in adoration one time and and I was reading Imitation of Christ and and it's still to this day and Jesus has not changed the channel. It's increase your virtues, decrease your vices. It's that like, simple. That yeah. was it. And I was like, is that it? Like, don't you have anything else to say to me, Lord? It was like, <laughs> let's just work on that joy for the rest of you, you know, until you die. It's like, okay. And that's that's been my my uh, my mantra of this journey. But now tell us, now, humility is misunderstood, right? I mean, people think, humility, what is it about? And do I have to be so low? I become a doormat, you know? Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? And what have you learned? That is such a great question. I encountered, there is a real resistance to humility, and I encounter that even in writing the book. You know, when you write a book, if there's something very romantic about that, and you tell people, I'm writing a book, and they're like, oh, that's so wonderful. I hated English class in high school. <laughs> and, uh, that's so great you're writing a book. And then they ask, what's your book about? Yeah. And I would say it's about humility. And everybody would get very weird, like, oh, that's <laughs> so interesting. I have a message I have to <laughs> respond to. We don't understand humility. And I think we think it's going to make our life terrible. Like mm -hmm. humility is about being a doormat and people walk all over me and I have to be <laughs> self-deprecating. I can't say good things about myself or think good things about myself. And those are real distorted perceptions that honestly, I think the devil can kind of pick at those things because mm -hmm. humility is such a good thing. Yeah. But if our perception of it is distorted, you know, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. I wonder, having lived a while, not as long as some other people, um, humility didn't seem to be that big of a difficulty when I was growing up in the 50s before the mm -hmm. sexual revolution and all a lot of modernity things you know took place because where we grew up anyway it was really like a working class people yeah they lived um, you know, very simply this paycheck could be your last paycheck you had to work we lived around a lot of humble people yeah. You, you know, and like they didn't even discuss humility. I mean, it just was. That was your lot and houses weren't all that grand mm -hmm. or big, but they had everything they needed in the house. And it seems like as we've gone on, you know, into more luxuries and and modern times and social media and, you know, that it, it becomes more and more difficult. The expectations that we have of what we should have. Oh, Jim, happiness is really about. 100%. It's getting worse the further we go along. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more difficult. It is. And you're hitting on... I mean, we could get real nerdy here, but you're hitting on a real shift that took place in at least American society after World War II, where things did become more individualistic. And after the sexual revolution, things started to become more about me. Mm -hmm. um, people went to work, not because they necessarily had to, but you had people saying, well, I need to go develop myself. And there was an emphasis taken off raising children. Uh, and then as we started to raise children recently, we're more individualized with our kids and helping them to grow and develop. And certainly there's good things to be said yeah. about some of these yeah. shifts, but it has made society more about yeah. me. What's in it for me versus mm -hmm. the collective good, right. the good of the other, the good of my family, yeah. the good of my neighbor. Yeah. How, what about uh, we as a, a society being so discontent mm. Would you say that being content is a way with humility? So when someone, because some people are chasing not humility, they're chasing the carrot, they're running, they're exhausted, mm -hmm. but they're so discontent. They think more is more and I need more, more, more where I'm going to have this cavity in my soul satisfied. How, what about contentment and humility? Oh, I think those two things go hand in hand, Joy. When you think about the world we live in today, Everything is so focused on what other people have. And I can see it, but I see it curated. 
I go on Facebook, I go on Instagram, and I'm not just seeing things that my peers have, but that celebrities have. Mm -hmm. And 15 years ago, we would say, who cares if that celebrity owns mm -hmm. a yacht? Like, I'm not a celebrity, I'm not gonna mm -hmm. own a yacht, but for some reason, in our minds, we feel like, well, I'm owed those things. And so social media continually stirs up discontent. When we know we're looking at a curated feed that is not reality, mm -hmm. but we feel like I should have it. Humility and contentment are linked together because contentment really is found in being humble enough to know who I am before God. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it comes in, is to say, I know who I am before the Lord, and that's enough to be loved, to be chosen, to be worthy. And just living into and accepting that reality produces humility and contentment because I have everything that I need already. Probably should have asked this early on, but a definition of humility, or how would you explain that? Like I said, my father was, don't be too big for your britches. Yeah. You know, it wasn't all that spiritual, but I got exactly what he was talking about, you know? So how do we define that? I'm sure saints define it in a particular way, but you know, I mean, if you ask this to people, adults or even young people, I mean, they'll be like, they didn't even thought about the word humility. Oh, and I think it goes along with contentment. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. If I were to define it simply for somebody, I yeah. would say humility is knowing who I am before God and being content that that is enough. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. to know who I am before the Lord. And that produces some really, it produces something different than what we think about mm -hmm. humility, right? Because if we think humility is self-deprecation, well, if God created me and created me good, but I look at myself and I say, oh, I'm not good, I'm low, I'm unworthy, I'm a terrible, horrible sinner. Um, I can acknowledge my sinfulness mm -hmm. while acknowledging God's mercy. Mm -hmm. But if I find myself in a place where I'm so, I feel like I'm depraved and unworthy and unlovable, well, what does that say about God's creation? Mm -hmm. It'd be like if my daughter drew me a picture and brought it to me and said, here's a picture, daddy. And rather than looking at it and saying, oh, that's so wonderful, that's beautiful, like it, I looked at her creation and said, oh, like that, it's not very good. Like it's mm -hmm. like you did this thing weird with the colors or the lines. Like I would never do that. Mm -hmm. But we do that when we look yeah. in the mirror and we're self-deprecating. Mm -hmm. Humility isn't that. Humility is knowing who I am before God and allowing that to be enough. Okay. The deal yeah. is this. The church doesn't believe that. Mm -hmm. The church doesn't believe what God says about them. We don't believe that as humans, especially this younger generation. Yeah coming through COVID and um, the suicide rate going up and depression going up. People don't believe, I just spoke to a college group the other night, they don't believe that God loves them. And mm -hmm. that's the devil's trick, right? And so you can't, e you can't even get an evaluation, a belief, a feeling that they are made in the image and likeness and they are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves them. Mm -hmm. How do we get them to believe that? Oh, that is such a difficult question. And I think part of it is by being witnesses of God's love. Mm -hmm. Like people feel unworthy of God's love because they have been told by other people, especially young people, that they are unworthy. Uh, sometimes it's by people close to them. Sometimes it's by friends. Yeah. Sometimes it's just in their own mind as they're seeing a flood of things online. And say, well, God really loved me. Wouldn't yeah. I have something different? Or yeah. maybe my circumstances would be different. They need witnesses of people to be tangible um, reminders of God's love. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the special role of parents. It is. And yeah. that's why it's so important for us to believe in the sanctity of marriage and mm -hmm. having a man and a woman that, that loves and that loves this child unconditionally and is affirming this child. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you know, part of the thing of understanding God's love is others as you're saying and people who want me for me. Exactly. They just so I lost my mom as a young boy, mm -hmm. and I had other women in my life that came into my life, my sisters and aunts and other people. And I can say to this day, all these women in my life didn't want anything from me, and they didn't want to be my mother. Mm -hmm. They were just feminine women who loved and affirmed me and helped to give me my identity as a man, as a young boy, and spoke that into my life. And so we can't do it for ourselves either. That's the other thing. We can't yeah. affirm ourselves enough. Well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm better looking than him or this and I'm more intelligent mm -hmm. than this one. It, it just doesn't work because as somebody has said that comparison is the death to peace. It comparison is. is mm -hmm. the, so once you start comparing, once you start looking at what the culture's telling you, mm -hmm. you know, about, I mean, you just can, you can never meet that. 
You can't know. I've heard it said another way too, and which resonates with me is comparison comes from envy, right? And envy makes rivals out of friends, mm. which has like sat with me for a very long time. And envy goes back, comparison actually goes back, I think, to pride. Mm -hmm. Because really what is envy or comparison at the source? It's saying, Jim, you have something yeah. and I wish I had it. And in fact, it goes deeper. Not only do I wish that you don't have it, yeah. I deserve it instead of you. Mm -hmm. And that's pride, that mm -hmm. I deserve something over what you have, that what the Lord's given you, yeah. shouldn't I really have that? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it goes back to humility. If I believe that God has given me everything I need and I am enough in God's eyes, I don't yeah. need to be envious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, you, in your book at some point, I think it's really in the beginning, you kind of do three questions or three mm -hmm. areas in relationship to humility. And so I, I, the first one is the most important. How does God see me? Mm. And then how do I see, how does God see me? But then how do I see myself, right? You say something yeah. about that. Uh, it, you know, am I, is it proportionate to what I really am yeah. here? And then there's something about other people. You, you say, and I don't know if it's how they see me or how do I want them to see me. It's Explain. how I want them to see me because I can't control how people see me. And this actually comes from a conversation I had with my dad as a teenager, which was formative on two levels. One is my dad just out of nowhere looked at me and said, I want you to know that nothing you do will ever make me love you less. Mm -hmm. I will always love you. And it goes back to the idea of unconditional love. Yeah. And we can think that about our kids, but if we don't say it, you can't just assume that they know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he told me the second piece. He said, you know, in your identity, there's three parts of it. Who God says you are, and that's okay, true, that's it's fixed. Mm -hmm. Who you say you are, what is the story you tell about yourself? Our stories are so powerful. And then how do I want others to see me? Um, so I how do I want them to How do to I want me? them to see me? So think like social media. If I have a story I tell about myself, it can align with the story God says about me. But if I'm afraid to share that with people, so. I'm a disciple, God says I'm a disciple, I'm a beloved child of God, but then I live as an atheist in the world. Well, that's incongruent, that's inauthentic. Yeah. And I think that's a struggle actually for a lot of people of faith right now is how do I want others to see me mm. as a good person, uh, as a humanist, yeah. as moral, but do I want others to see me as a Christian or do I fear judgment for that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Speak to us, uh, you know, a large section of your book in, well, yeah, is the litany of humility. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's your life experiences and what you learned through the school of, of you know, really knowing who you are and knowing yeah. God is and, and encounters and so on. How's the litany of humility? What do you want to say about the litany? It's, it's great. I try to do it every day through song. Mm -hmm. Daniel Rose sings the litany of humility. And tell us a little bit about the litany of humility. What difference it made in your life uh, regarding the way of humility and how you use it in the book, the structure of your book, the format. Yeah, I discovered the litany of humility as a 21-year-old youth minister. So I began working at a parish and I was... Uh, very young and somebody going into it said, you know, you're going to be working with adults who are older than you. So you've really got to show them that you know what you're doing and kind of be like the alpha dog. And that was the wrong <laughs> advice. It was well intended, but it was the wrong advice. Um, and I went in and just made a mess of things. Um, and there was one night where only a handful of kids showed up. I felt like a total failure. And instead of accepting that humiliation, I got very prideful and was like, Lord, like you made a mistake sending me to this place. You shouldn't have sent me to this parish. Mm -hmm. For that youth night, I asked the kids, what is something you've prayed for and gotten? And one girl raised her hand and said, you know, um, we prayed that we would get a new youth minister and God sent you. <laughs> and I don't know how Jesus loves you, but sometimes <laughs> Jesus shakes me and that's yeah. the Lord loving me. And I was like, wow. Uh, mm -hmm. So I told my pastor about it and he gave me the litany of humility. Mm -hmm. And that's how I discovered the prayer. It's a beautiful deliverance prayer mm -hmm. from disordered desires, from fear that creeps in when we let go of those disordered desires. Yeah. And then asking Jesus to fill that space where we had a disordered desire with something good. Mm -hmm. I think it's a perfect prayer and I think it's a necessity for any disciple yeah. today to you pray. You just need to search that and put in Litany of Humility. Go to EW10.com and put it in. And as you were saying, it's, it's uh, from the desire of being esteemed, mm -hmm. loved, extolled, honored, praised, inordinate desire for these things mm -hmm. and uh, preferred, consulted, approved. <laughs> And then from the fear, so it goes from desire to fearfulness. Yeah. W what's the fears that we may have? Being humiliated, being despised, suffering rebukes, being calumniated, being forgotten, being ridiculed, being wronged, being suspected. And then it goes to desiring good for others. Yeah, and I think that's where I believe it's a perfect prayer. And in my experience with it, I rearranged the 
petitions a little bit because I found that they lined up. Mm. So when we say, Lord, deliver me from the desire of being loved, like this disordered desire to be loved above, yeah. all, above all else, right. that leaves a hole in mm. me. And those empty spaces are where fear can creep in. Jesus tells this story about a man who uh, gets rid of these demons out of his house and sweeps it and keeps it clean. And then they roam the land and they come back stronger than before. And I've never quite understood that. Like, wow, what a weird parable, Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what did the man forget to do? Lock the door. Mm -hmm. So when we leave these open spaces, we can be delivered from something. But if we don't fill in that area with something else, something worse creeps in. Mm -hmm. um, so fear creeps in. Yeah. If I'm not loved, people will hate me. That's what the devil says. If people don't love you, mm -hmm. Joy, they're going to hate you. They're going to despise you. So now I fear being despised and I go back to that disordered desire. So I ask the Lord to give me something good that others would be loved more than I. Well, Joel, we're going to have to stop at this point and look forward to tomorrow so you can open some more doors for us and shut some doors for mm -hmm. us through the Litany of Humility and your wonderful book, Chasing Humility, Ave Maria Press, Eight Ways to Shape a Christian Heart. Plenty more to come. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and now we bring to you today Father John Paul. Now, Father, what did you think of Joel sharing on chasing humility? Well, I, I like that conversation that you first had with your grandkids, mm -hmm. uh, where you brought up what is humility, and mm -hmm. you talked about humiliation. And they said, you know, I know what humiliation is. And my immediate thought is, you know, we don't really know what humility is unless we know what humiliation is. Mm -hmm. um, because in being humiliated, we become humble. Mm -hmm. we, we recognize our littleness, our nothing, nothingness. Yeah. Uh, a good priest uh, that was here years ago uh, used to say, uh, we're not going to be humble unless we know what humiliation is. Mm -hmm. um, because we recognize again yeah. that God is God and we're yeah. not God. Yeah. Um, and um, we know humility by looking at Jesus, uh, by looking at him in the Gospels. Uh, I know you, you had that prayer, the beautiful prayer, uh, the Litany of Humility yeah. by Cardinal Mary Duval. I was actually at his tomb about a month and a half ago mm -hmm. uh, down in the Vatican Grottoes. Uh, he was the Secretary of State of Pope St. Pius X, uh, and he composed that prayer, mm. the Litany of Humility. Um, and it's all about um, deliverance. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, there's many different um, aspects of deliverance. You just read the Gospels. You know, Jesus delivering um, and casting out demons yeah. from people um, and healing the sick and reaching out to um, people, lepers. Yeah. You know, if we look at Jesus... We, we become more humble. The closer mm -hmm. we get to Jesus, the more humble we get. Most of all in the Eucharist, I think. Um, that uh, That's his most vulnerable form among us, the most humble form of God among us. That when we come before him at, holy, at the holy sacrifice of the Mass in adoration, uh, we can't help but become more humble. Mm -hmm. uh, if yeah. we're truly coming before God and looking at God as God, um, we become little and small, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. We recognize that yeah. uh, that God, that's the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, he humbles us through his, his goodness. Like I was sharing with our, our grandchildren, he was sharing about humility and true humility. I said, you know, and I had just gotten back from this because we went to Saturday Vigil Mass mm -hmm. and they go to Sunday. And I said, you know what, with all I think about myself and all the struggles and this and that, God Almighty just came into me. Mm -hmm. I started saying, yeah. look, I said, God Almighty in the sacrament. I could do nothing. There's nothing. I, I can't do anything to make him come. I'm so uh, totally unworthy, except that he would come to me. Do you understand the Eucharist? And that's the, the greatest time in your day, mm. the greatest time in your week when you have literally um, the sacrament of his body and blood within you. That's the time to ask 
Lord, make me more humble. Mm. Because you have humility yeah. itself within you. Humility equals truth. Yeah. And when we have Jesus himself within us, wow. we're going to become more humble. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Hopefully we're cooperating with his grace. Yeah. It's beautiful, Father. Close us in a prayer and a blessing, please. Family, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to you and be merciful to you. May he show you his kindness and give you his peace. May mm -hmm. the blessing of Almighty God come upon you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. You're an important part of this EWTN family. You're never alone, and you're always at home with Jim and with Joy. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.